My plan today is to uh, do a case presentation and um, give you a little bit of an overview of decisional conflict. I think it should be 25 years in decisional conflict rather than of decisional conflict. Because um, it's always been a confusing area of how to best measure uh, shared decision making and I think it's still uh, a challenge. Uh, and then I'll be talking more about the practice version of the tool, and you'll get a chance to be introduced to it shortly. And we'll have a discussion on one of the questions. I had listed three questions, and we'll focus on the third question, as I initially had more time, but we only have time to focus on one question right now. Um, so let's start with the case presentation. And actually, you are the case. So what I want you to do is to think about a big decision, so big, that you or someone you know is facing over the next year. So we're talking about the future. Uh, in the previous uh, case, you talked about the past, now we're talking about the future. Um, so it's either you or someone you know faces in the next year. And here's some doors, starting with self-care to uh, some minimal medical interventions to more invasive interventions. So it could start off with, uh, you know, one of your big decisions might be moving to aggressive treatments when simpler options fail for these chronic conditions. Could be surgery or radiation for cancer. Could be uh, surveillance or something more invasive for genetic issues. Uh, life transitions, probably many of you it's the life transitions, which could be reproduction, parenting, caregiver role, aging, but it could also be education, relocation, retirement, those big life decisions that many of us face. Location of care at, uh, uh, at the time of birth, illness, chronic condition or death, and or intensity of care and technology if you have someone with very low birth weight but also end stage disease. So thinking about this big decision that you, you or someone you know is facing, what I'd like you to do is fill out the SURE test, which is located at the uh, bottom of page 27. Four questions, answering yes or no. Okay, um, so uh, we'll just have a show of hands. How many answered uh, no to the first question? Okay, so looking around the room, you can see that there's a lot of uncertainty, and that's because you're facing a big decision in the future, and most people don't feel sure when they face a big decision. Okay, so then, um, how many people felt they didn't know the benefits and risks of each option? You can see there's fewer people that feel they don't have enough information about benefits and risks of each option, and many of you feel comfortable with, with that information. Are you clear about which benefits and risks matter most to you? How many said no to that? Okay, can you see how many, can you keep your hands up? So way more people answered no to that question than answered no to the information question. This is a message to every one of us who loves providing information. Sometimes it's not the information, it's a clarification of what matters most. Okay, and then the last one. Do you have enough support and advice to make a choice? How many people said no to that one? So you can see that support is an issue for some people, but it's not as common as the, 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 uh, the third question. And this is very typical in any audience, and usually it's because you're facing big life decisions, usually life transitions. It's not always a medical decision. And big life decisions really uh, hit at the values of what matters to you. And they usually often involve others. So you don't really know if you've, you've got the support you need to make that big decision. Okay, so let's, uh, that, you're the case study. Let's move then just to a brief overview of the construct of decisional conflict. This was a construct that uh, built on the work of uh, Janice, who was a psychologist but it actually was defined in the North American Nursing Diagnosis Group uh, way back in the 1980s, recently published in 2002. Uh, it's personal uncertainty, so it's personal, not clinical uncertainty, personal uncertainty about which course of action to take. So in your head you're saying yes, no, maybe so. And although the reason it it's makes you feel uncertain is because it's big, you know, it's complicated, there's you know, benefits and risks, there are some modifiable factors that contribute to this personal uncertainty. And that's, you know, feeling uninformed about the options, benefits, and risks, feeling unclear about what matters most to you, 
and feeling unsupported in decision making, which map on to the items that you see there, understanding information, risk benefit ratio, and encouragement to sort of give you that sure, um, uh, what do you call those things, sure, anagram? Anagram? Yeah. So we have a research version of this decisional conflict scale at 16 items, uh, and a responding, from uh, responding from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And uh, we've applied it in, there's now over 207 published studies uh, using the scale, 10 countries, 13 languages. And in uh, the 86 trials, in the Cochrane Trials of Decision Aids, about uh, nearly half of them have used it for a total of 4,000 uh, patients in those trials. But it started off as an assessment of what people's decisional needs were at the time. It's a process measure. So basically, I've assessed your decisional needs. What, how is it, what do you feel about um, this decision right now, where you're at? And that's because of my nursing background. I do a lot of coaching and decision making. And I want to know what you're feeling right now about this decision. Um, it also can tailor the decision support to the needs. So values is huge. Information may help a little bit in the sense that you might not be clear about what matters most to you because you really don't know what it's like to experience these outcomes and how to value, how to place a value judgment on these outcomes. But um, uh, it helps you to, dis and if support is an issue, you need to explore that. So it helps you to tailor what you're going to talk to the patient about. Because in the past, what we see in standard coaching is just information. You know, and often, although you need to assess what people know factually, um, uh, uh, actually a lot of the need is often somewhere else that, uh, in order to help somebody with those needs. And then, of course, used to evaluate decision support interventions as reported in those uh, trials of decision aids. Before I get into the psychometrics, I asked uh, Jean uh, Nelson, how does this link to your, uh, your way of looking at quality? And, uh, and he said it would be uh, under the readiness part, basically the, the comfort with decision making that you're, that you're experiencing. Are you ready to make a decision? And actually, ironically, in French, the decisional conflict scale is called uh, confort décisionnel, decisional comfort. And I guess in retrospect, maybe after 25 years, we should be sif shifting to that, uh, that concept. So there have been some psychometric testing on the big research scale. I'm not going to go into it in good deal, but generally it's... Uh, uh, reported good reliability. It's correlated to knowledge, but if you look, it's 0 .30 correlation to knowledge. So it doesn't replace asking people their understanding of what they know, because some people feel more knowledgeable than they really are on a knowledge test, and other people feel less knowledgeable even though they score well. So I think that illustrates the gap between what people know on a knowledge test versus how they feel, how informed they feel. And sometimes the coaching role is to bridge the gap between how people feel and, and what they know. So uh, feeling informed doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to score high on a knowledge test. Those two things are separate and important things to look at. It is also correlated to downstream discontinuance of treatments. Uh, if people have high decisional conflict, they discontinue treatments more likely. They also have higher regret. And uh, one study in Australia showed that you're more likely to blame the doctor for bad outcomes. Um, it discriminates between those who delay and make decisions. So it's often a, a barrier to, to making those decisions. And uh, patients exposed to usual care versus decision aids, it discriminates there as well. And it's responsive to change. And I'm just going to show you this uh, tool here that shows that um, this is high decisional conflict in uh, Dale Collins' population of breast cancer patients. So uh, time one, time two, and time three. So if you look at it, people feel uh, uninformed, unclear about values, unsupported, and have high uncertainty. After using a decision aid in the gray, they're more likely to feel um, uh, um, that, you know, that declines. So they, they're starting to feel more comfortable with their decision process. But this is exposure to a decision aid. It's not talking to the clinician. And the only time it drops dramatically is after they've talked to the clinician. So for all the clinicians, you can be reassured you have a role in decision support. That sending somebody a decision aid doesn't close the loop on the decision and doesn't reduce the decisional comfort. And that's particularly true for uncertainty. 
because uh, you know this is somebody who has breast cancer. They haven't talked to the expert about you know what option they have, and it, and particularly on uncertainty, you help to close the loop on that decision, make somebody feel more comfortable. It's also important for you to note that at time three, after they've seen the clinician, there is still a residual group that aren't happy, and maybe Amy was one of those because she didn't have a good experience with her surgeon. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that because the uh, evaluation of, of um, the versions, the sure version, is at the after, after using, seeing the clinician. So the re there's a research version and then there's a practice version which you've just looked at and it allows you to rapidly monitor uh, decisional needs and it's used in the coaching protocols with nurses, um, on personal decision forms, in quality reports and as a screening tool in primary care. And this is an example of one that's used in Ottawa but Ivan Tomek helped to develop it here at Dartmouth that summarizes uh, clinically what's going on with the patient, uh, what's their preference, how knowledgeable do they feel, uh, what are their values, and how supported they feel. And so the four sh uh, sure items are in there, but also uh, decision quality items which will be discussed in, later in this conference. Uh, and here's uh, an example of a quality report on uh, the sure items at Dartmouth. And there is a little bit on the sure items in terms of psychometrics. Um, uh, this has been done in, in three different areas, um, and actually uh, Audrey ferrand Pare is, put your hand up there, she just uh, helped with the recent evaluation of uh, this. Um, so the reliability uh, ranges from 0.54 to 0.7. It discriminates between those who do or don't choose a treatment, and sh uh, Audrey has just demonstrated a sensitivity and specificity that's reasonable. And also, intriguingly, it's correlated to downstream regret, which was mentioned by somebody earlier. So the psychometrics of the short version is starting to show promise as a, as a clinical tool.